Hello, I'm State Representative Justin Chenet. And I'm State Senator Linda Valentino. And today we're bringing Augusta to you from our office in downtown Saco. So this week was the first week of the biennial budget hearings, especially in appropriations. Over 100 people showed up from all across the state, voicing their opinions, especially regarding uh, nonprofit tax and municipal revenue sharing. Well, one of the biggest things was the municipal revenue sharing. We had um, many people, over 50 people, just from different towns, whether it was from Madawaska or Callis or North and South Berwick, all over the entire state, come to us um, to give us really information on the municipal revenue sharing. Uh, the idea that taxing the nonprofits would make up for the loss of municipal revenue sharing really doesn't hold true in the rural communities because the rural communities do not have the nonprofits that Portland or even Saco or Lewiston and other towns have. So that was a real eye opener for us on the municipal revenue sharing end of it that um, it's not going to work for the small rural towns. And it's going to significantly impact their local budgets, which could in turn impact the bottom line, which is property taxes. Exactly. And this is really what it was about was um, property taxes, the shift um, going over to property taxes um, by the reduction on the income tax, the increase in the sales tax, and the increase in the property taxes. People were beginning to um, have questions now about the entire concept of the budget. And when you combine that with the elimination of the homestead exemption for so many people under the age of 65, and then we double it to in the budget for those over 65, you, you, you probably saw a lot of individuals question that. This was probably the most surprising thing that we had in the public hearings, is that we actually had people um, over 65 mm -hmm. that came in and instead of testifying for the doubling of the homestead exemption for over 65, they said that they didn't want it. They came in and they said, um, I don't need to have my homestead exemption doubled, but my children need to keep their homestead exemption. One man came in and said, um, I don't want to feel that I am being pitted against my neighbor, where I am taking away their homestead exemption so I can double my home exemption. And I think what best, um, the first reaction, we had a constituent walk into our office yesterday, and he was sitting here right on the couch, and we mentioned that um, the homestead exemption was gonna double for people over it's 65. Like, yes, yes. yes. And, he, and he cheered, yes. And we said, but it's going to be eliminated for all of your children. And he said, well, I don't want that. Right. They need it more than I do. And I yeah. think that was the biggest takeaway I got this week. Right. And I know this is something that um, for young people, right. uh, you've been uh, very involved in. Right, I mean, it, it, it's about keeping young people here in the state, encouraging more young families to move here. And if we're not incentivizing that through our tax system, it's, it's not gonna do us any good. Basically, what's in the current budget is incentivizing seniors, and it, while we may, we have to make sure that seniors can stay in their home, they can afford their medication, they can afford to live there, we need to be incentivizing young people to live here, to expand the tax base, to ensure we have a vibrant young workforce in particular for a lot of the industries. And this is something I talked about in, in my, um, my recent column in the Portland Press Herald uh, regarding young people and the need to focus on youth-oriented issues. I mean, the governor talks about wanting to, to help young people and attract young people and yet the budget is not really as it currently stands does not really reflect those that set of priorities so making sure we're focusing on college affordability making sure we're focusing on on creating a strong vibrant economy and in particular a tax system that benefits young people I mean we're, because we're so burdened with student loan debt I mean that's basically a mortgage I mean your daughter's running into a similar yeah. situation with that I you know so many of my peers are in the same boat how can we afford to, to have a house when our students loans are through the roof. So it, 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 it's a domino effect and we have to make sure that we're addressing a multitude of issues. Yeah and one of the other things that came up was this whole shift um, eliminating the revenue sharing mm -hmm. and putting it onto the property taxes. One of the key components on that as I mentioned um, a few minutes ago was taxing the nonprofits. Right. And one of the exemptions were churches 
uh, but the definition are houses of worship. So there was a very lengthy discussion on that, on what really constitutes the uh, house of worship. So many people now, there are so many different religions in the state of Maine, um, have ceremonies out of their home. Does that mean now their houses would be tax exempt? Also on churches, is it just where the worship takes place or is it also going to include the tax exemption for their kitchens, for their banquet halls, for movie theaters that some theaters have in it, and for other amenities that they have. Um, also the schools um, came in and like Catholic schools, um, does that apply also now um, as a school because they worship in the school? Some summer camps came in and said, we do worship at our camp. Can we have the tax exempt prof, um, you know, eligibility? And so there's a lot of really kinks. And that's the purpose of the public hearing, is to hear from all of these people and say, well, I guess that wasn't thought of when we did the budget. And flush that out. And yeah. that's what the yeah. Appropriations Committee needs to clarify uh, along with the legislature. And I, I we would be remiss to say that, let's talk about some good news <laughs> before uh, every, all these heavy soft topics. Um, we just learned this week that uh, the, the striking Fairpoint workers and their union have reached an agreement with Fairpoint uh, and they're going to be returning to work this week, which is so exciting. Uh, and it's been a long sought after battle. And we're so glad that, especially a lot of our constituents, that this impacts. They'll be able to go back to work so they don't have to be out in the freezing temperatures, uh, you know, uh, petitioning so that they can, you know, get a fair deal. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, that's what it's about, is making sure that they can have, you know, a strong livelihood. So we're really thankful for that. Yeah, and another good news we had the. Um January revenue reports that came in, and one of the things that um, was very good news is that Maine has had, had the strongest fourth quarter since 2003. So we had a really good fourth quarter um, with all of the holiday shopping that was going in. Uh, revenues were up 19% on lodging, 18% um, on automobile sales, and 12% on prepared foods which meant a lot of people were out uh, whining and dining during the holidays, spending their Do money the snow. on it. And uh, <laughs> one of the things also that especially we attributed in January was due to the lower um, gas and energy prices yeah, that we had. That's been Even though we've had a, a lot of snow, the prices have been down, thankfully, for us. And it's giving the consumers a little bit more confident to go out there and do some spending. So hopefully the signals may be that we have turned a corner and that the economy in Maine is now starting to uptick. So let's that was keep very it up. Yes. So let's keep that up, yes. <laughs> All right, this has been the latest from the State House from our local office here on Main Street in Saco. Uh, so thank you for watching. We'll see you right back here next week. Thank Thank you very much.